Today's episode of the Stallside Podcast was brought to you by Rudin Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy. Horses don't often have a problem with their skin, but when they do, scratches, bumps, wheels, hives, insect bites can be a major issue. This week on Stallside, we're talking to Dr. Julia Miller from the Animal Dermatology Clinic in Louisville about all the things you need to know about your horse's skin health. Dr. Miller, welcome to Stallside. Hi, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's great to have you here. Julia, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, so I've been a lifelong equestrian. I started riding when I was about four, got my first pony for Christmas. Very lucky child. Um, and then I grew up riding, also loved music and singing. So for undergrad, I was actually an opera major. And then I, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> a little different. <laughs> That's why I keep saying I want to do a recording in here. It's lovely. Um, and then I decided to switch gears and go back to vet school. Um, prior to vet school, I actually did farrier school and was a certified farrier for a little while because I love equine podiatry. Uh, still do. And then when I was in vet school, I was equine track, thought I wanted to be an equine surgeon, was ready for it. Uh, did my internship at the University of Georgia, which I loved. But after that, I really uh, saw a lot of value in general practice and kind of the what happens before the referral setting. So I went into mixed animal practice after that. I did quite a bit of equine, but found myself slowly moving more towards the dark side, if you will, of small animal, um, <laughs> and then eventually became a full-time small animal veterinarian. Uh, and that's where I fell in love with dermatology. So I went back to Cornell in 2019 from a dermatology residency, or in 2017 rather, from my derm residency, um, got boarded and have since been practicing mostly on dogs and cats, because that's your bread and butter. But I love doing equine derm every chance I get because I miss being an equine practitioner. I don't necessarily miss, you know, 3 a.m. hawk lacerations on the unhalter broke filly, but at the same time, I love being around horses, so it's it's fun for me to be able to get to do it. Well, you're a lady of many talents, <laughs> and we're so grateful for one of them is for your passion for equine dermatology because we have a lot of horses that come into the clinic, and you know you get the sort of fairly routine things, but then occasionally we have these cases which they just require that little bit more that a board certified dermatologist can give us, and so you coming to the area is just a total godsend for us. And it's just such a great day every time you come down because we get to learn a lot and we also get to um, um, just talk about stuff and yep. actually uh, get to places where our minds didn't think they could go. So... What's, what do you want to talk to us about today? Yeah, so I thought today it'd be good for me to talk about the things I get asked commonly that maybe aren't the zebras or the weirdos, but the more common stuff that we see. So I like to talk a lot about distal limb dermatitis or scratches. Mm -hmm. And then I also get asked an awful lot about how to manage hives. So I thought we could kind of talk through the different things there. That is excellent because two of the main problems that I have to deal <laughs> yeah. with when it comes to horses' skin are my horse has hives yeah. or how do we get rid of these scratches? So the floor is yours. Take it away. Perfect. So we'll go through a little bit here, um, you know, just some fun pictures, but I know we'll try to keep it mostly uh, vocal. So first we'll talk about scratches. And I just want to remind everybody that scratches is a really general term. It doesn't necessarily mean anything specific. It just means your horse has dermatitis or inflammation of the skin on the distal limb. And this can be caused, uh, the clinical signs of this can be wide ranging, right? We see things like scabs and crusts. We can see the hair kind of raise up in tufts. It can go down all the way to hair loss, oozing. They can become painful and swollen. So there's a real spectrum of clinical signs that we see with them. And the things that I think are important to remember with scratches are we all get really focused on killing the bacteria, killing the fungus. But the bacteria and the fungus is usually actually a secondary thing, that there are more predisposing factors that we always need to consider when we're thinking about managing and treating scratches in horses. So I kind of think of it like the three Ps. There's predisposing factors, there's primary factors, and then there's the perpetuating factors. And if you don't touch on all of the Ps, if you leave one P out of the equation, you're not going to be very successful in your management. So the predisposing factors, for example, are so important. And the number one predisposing factor is the environment the horse lives in. When we talk about treatment in just a minute, you'll notice that I focus a lot on that because you'll hear me say you can slather all the creams in the world on a horse, but if it's standing in poop water, it ain't going to get better. So I think it's important that we think about all of the different causes. There are also primary factors like physical irritants. Are we causing harm with what we're putting on? Some horses are very sensitive, um, parasites and things like that. And then our perpetuating factors, the final P, are the things like the bacteria and the fungi, which we have to manage. But you also need to think about why did your horse get to that point, kind of what predisposed them. That's actually a brilliant philosophy. And that's just says 
we've said before about mind going to different places, you've actually just categorised this and made complete sense. Yeah, thank you. I tried. <laughs> yeah, no, you did. It just made complete sense. You think about the three Ps. So, um, yeah, yeah. Talk, talk us through. So uh, it's important to know that there are a number of different causes, right? Every First of all, everybody thinks scratches is ringworm, and it just is not. It can be at times. That is a potential cause, yes, but there are many other potential causes. The number one thing is what started the ball rolling, and for most horses, the vast majority of horses, yeah, there's a genetic component in some of them. You know, there's always that horse on the farm that gets scratches every year. But for most of our horses, there's an initial wound or trauma, and that could be from mostly, usually, macerated skin. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But the secondary factors that we can see are things like rain rot, which we'll talk about. Ringworm can happen. Other bacterial infections. Allergies. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about allergies in the second part of this. One of my favorite things to talk about, but that can predispose horses to scratches. Uh, Chorioptic mange in your heavy draft horse. Horses. There's also some weirdos like photosensitization, vasculitis, and things like that. That's where I come in. Whenever things look weird on a distal limb, I love to see them because there are some uh, more unusual causes that we need to think about too. So when I talked about maceration, I like to think about the sort of tub reference. If you sit in the tub for too long and your fingers get all wrinkly, that's what happens to horse skin if they stand in the muddy water or the wet pasture for too long. And where the skin cells of the are normally very tight together and they don't allow any bacteria or fungi to penetrate, when they sit in the water and they get macerated, that wrinkliness sort of spreads the keratinocytes or the skin cells apart. And then that allows inflammatory mediators, bacteria, fungus to get deeper into the tissue and that's what instigates the actual bacterial infection. So one of the biggest predisposing factors for these horses, which is why we see a lot of scratches in the spring and the fall, is moisture. And moisture management is something that I harp on all the time and can make a huge difference in how you, you treat these horses. Yeah, that's a great observation because, you know, people sort of say, oh, the horse went out on the wet mm. pasture, dew poisoning. Mm -hmm. That just makes perfect sense. It's because the skin is chronically wet and it loses its ability to defend itself. Absolutely. It's it's all, unfortunately one of the hardest things to manage, yeah. but it is, I think, one of the most important things to manage. Yeah, it's really difficult because how do you keep the horse dry when the grass is wet? We'll talk about that in just a second, but yes, it's important. There's a couple quick things I wanted to bring up that horses can get that we don't necessarily think about on the distal limb. One of them is rain rot. So when we think about rain rot, we're thinking about top line, you know, the paintbrush crusts along that. And we think about the wet seasons with the, the wet hair and the long hair macerating the skin. And absolutely, we can see that on the distal limb as well. It looks a little differently clinically, but um, it's important to know that that can be a cause. And in case you didn't know, ringworm or rain rot rather is actually caused by a bacteria. It's called Dermatophilus congolensis. And what's cool about that is I thought of like a Congo line of bacteria. Um, that's how you can see that it's kind of like two bacteria side by side. Mm -hmm. And for this one, there can be a seasonality, right? When anytime it's wet. So I used to be taught that there was a very specific seasonality to it. But when you live somewhere where it's wet all year round, I really think it takes away the seasonality for this. So anytime it's wet, you can see rain rot. Oh, bacteria. There's a, a couple of locations we saw on here, right? Top line legs and muzzle. That's another place I think people forget that rain rot can live. That dew poisoning, for example, that you were talking about. Dew poisoning is kind of a photosensitivity thing, but it actually is usually exacerbated by rain rot or dermatophilosis can be sitting in there. So not only is it important to keep those horses out of the moisture, but you actually may also need to treat the bacterial infection that can be there too, because it's a cool little twofer when you mm -hmm. have a, a dew poisoning horse. Another thing they can get on their legs is just a staph infection, plain old staph. Now, it's usually staph aureus because humans like to pick horse legs. And so we actually give our horses bacteria. Isn't that fun? Um, so don't pick. We'll talk about that a lot later, but absolutely don't pick. Uh, unfortunately, staph bacterial infection can look super similar to the rain rot or the dermatophilosis that we see. So this is something where I think a vet can often help you figure out what you've got going on with diagnostics. And then I wanted to bring up things like photosensitivity can also be a cause. Um, this is something we don't see nearly as commonly, but this is where walking the pasture can be very helpful. There are certain plants in the area, and I'm learning that Kentucky plants moved here not that long ago, um, but there are certain plants in the area that can lead to different kinds of photosensitization. So another thing that, that can lead to um, distal and dermatitis in horses, which is pretty cool. Um, but you may say, you know, if you have a vet and you got a weird case and they say, hey, walk your pasture and look for these things, this might be what they're talking about. That's interesting. You're talking about photosensitivity, um, the white hair, the pink mm -hmm. skin, because mm -hmm. it seems to be very much homed in on those areas. And that probably makes sense if it's a photosensitivity as part of this. Yes. And I think photosensitivity 
personally plays a big role in lots of horses. You know, we think about the true liver disease can cause photosensitivity or true exposure to certain plants. But I think there's a mild degree of photosensitivity in a lot of these horses that you may not be able to actually find the offending plant in the pasture, but something's there. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these horses, you're exactly right. They get affected on the white part of the limb. You know, the normal black or chestnut or bay part of the leg is is not affected. So we do see that pretty commonly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually just solved the problem for me because people ask me why just the white areas why yeah. just the pink skin and again i didn't never really consider that photosensitivity yeah. could be part of these conditions oh for sure yeah absolutely especially when it's sunny so florida mm-hmm. it's always that mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> here i'd say 50 50 it mm-hmm. seems yeah so there's some pictures up there that just show that photosensitivity can even go further than just the normal scratches and can look more severe and as a general rule if you as an owner are seeing something that looks really severe call your vet that's the rule to go by there's lots of scratches that probably doesn't need a vet to come right out for the horse but if you're seeing deep oozing lesions, brown crusts, ulcers or places of skin are missing, that's definitely a case where you're going to want to call your vet out. That's the kind of horse that might need systemic treatment or oral or injectable medications along with kind of some topical treatments. And then I also wanted to bring up another weirdo just to kind of put this on people's radar and another reason why you might want to get your family vet or even your your local friendly dermatologist invest, uh, involved is vasculitis. Mm-hmm. And this is another thing that I think we see, I am seeing more and more of this in horses. Again, it often affects the white, but it can affect both the white and the, um, the other fur. And for the vasculitis cases, it tends to be swollen limbs, more oozy, eroded lesions, again, much more severe looking and very very well demarcated, almost like a little bite was taken out of the leg. And vasculitis cases are tricky because they don't respond to the traditional antimicrobial, keep them out of the moisture management. These need steroids, anti-inflammatories. They need much more aggressive treatment. So if you're seeing something that kind of looks like what the pictures are up here, that's another great example of a time to call your vet. You may need to do something like biopsies or deep cultures or things like that. Yeah, that's um, like the next step to go to. And I think a lot of people are resistant to take biopsies of the horse I mean it's not exactly the easiest part to biopsy how would you um, tell somebody the value of the biopsy to sort of convince them this is what you need to do for your horse absolutely so I think one of the big things is how do I know what to treat unless I know what problem I have and so I love biopsies because they're going to give me a definitive diagnosis you have a a deep bacterial infection or you have a photo aggravated vasculitis or you have a weird type of cancer that can come on the distal limb or you have a nematode with habronema in -hmm. this weird thing that's on the distal limb so I'm a big fan of biopsying horses when the treatments that should have worked are not working appropriately because I'm clearly missing something. Mm -hmm. And if I'm missing it, I want to know what it is. And I think a biopsy is a fantastic way to do that. I've biopsied a lot of distal limbs. You know, just be careful where you do it. Um, You know, block the horse nicely, give them some some good sedation. And it's a very doable thing. The other thing that I love to do on distal limbs when they get chronic and there's issues are deep tissue cultures. And that's something that, you know, just a surface culture swab can be helpful. But as you might imagine, bacterial stuff on the the distal limb of a horse, you're going to grow everything under the sun because the horses literally are near poop all day so you're going to grow poop much of the time what I want to know is what's actually in the tissue what bacteria is deep in that tissue causing disease and tissue cultures are something I do regularly on horses like this as well and I find that they've really helped me hone in on is there a bacteria and what is the right antibiotic because I do see drug resistance in some of these horses especially if they've been on a variety of topicals or oral medications absolutely I've had horses that you know the TM isn't working why isn't it working well it's resistant to it and the only way i knew that was by actually doing a deep tissue culture yeah that's uh that's important information because let's face it people just want to put these horses on something and have it go away and we're not treating the right thing most of the Mm -hmm. time and sort of straying into treatment you mentioned there's a lot of non-specific things that you can do to actually improve the environment of that skin to get give it a better chance for the animal to heal itself so what are the sorts of things that you do to keep the skin dry or to manage the photosensitivity yeah i have a couple of mantras with this and one is right on there and it's clean and dry is worth a try so i think it's very (laughs) important that you try that like I i recognize how hard it is i've been a horse owner i lived in upstate new york and what felt like swamp 
mop season, you know, every April and May. So I totally understand. But environmental management can be really important. And pasture management is where it starts. So number one, walk your pastures. Are there mud pits anywhere? One of the mud pit areas tends to be the feeding rack. If you, you know, have an area where you do hay feeding or, or whether you do, you have like a run-in area where they get their grain, check that area thoroughly. Those tend to be the mud pits and see if your pony is the one that likes to be in the mud pits. Well, how do you get them out of it? A couple options. You can certainly put uh, crushed stone in your pasture. I've seen people do that. Identify the areas where it is really wet and, and actually have somebody come out and do some work on the pasture itself. Crushed stone is very nice. Um, I've also had horses that just need to be in the barn sometimes. And I know that's frustrating and difficult, especially I used to have a thoroughbred off the track who would lose his marbles when he was inside. But there were a couple weeks that it was just too mucky in that pasture. And honestly, I was also worried about a strain. So, you know, for him, he just lived inside when if I could not get him out of a super soupy pasture. Because again, I don't care what cream you put on. If that horse is standing in poop water, it's never going to get better. Another thing that can really help is is trimming your pastures down. And people forget about this, but remember, if you ever walked outside in the morning when the dew is on there, it's wet. I mean, my pant, the bottoms of my pants would get soaking wet just from walking through the grass. And a lot of our horses have, you know, the lesions right at the coronary band or sort of the distal pastern. And in that case, the grass may be that tall. And actually, when they're out in the morning getting their morning grass, it's full of sugar, how fun, but also they're getting a lot of moisture on their limbs. So I find that if you can can go out with your old pasture mower and trim that grass down really short that can help eliminate the moisture that's getting on their legs kind of in especially morning and evening when the pasture is super wet it's also better i think for parasites from what i understand but you know don't quote me on that i'm a dermatologist um, another thing that can be helpful is rem removing manure if at all possible because that's a poop source i think removing manure is always good for your pasture management um, and so that's something i usually recommend for them the other thing is you know if you if you are able to keep them in the stall, make sure that your stall is clean and dry. And I always hesitate to have people do straw bedding for these horses. And the reason is straw bedding can be lovely and wonderful, but man, can it be pokey. And anytime, you know, a horse that has an irritated distal mm -hmm. limb is standing in, you know, halfway uh, cannon bone deep straw, I always wonder how much of that straw is creating little micro abrasions that could make things worse. So you shouldn't overbed these horses, you know, make sure that you're not keeping them in floofy shavings that again are all the way up to their, you know, mid cannon mm -hmm. and be careful with how deep you're using your your something like straw as well so keeping their bedding clean and dry i think is really important there wraps and things like that you know i really don't think you necessarily need to wrap these horses if you're putting them outside in a wrap and it's wet outside all you're going to do is keep a wet wrap on the skin and that's definitely not what you want to do so i usually don't recommend that we wrap these guys um, but i do recommend that you clip the affected area because mm -hmm. if it's a springtime horse and you know they have their kind of like mini feathers after coming out of the winter if that long fur gets really wet then what it's going to do is just clamp down onto the skin and then it's going to keep that moisture on the skin so i do recommend clipping these horses don't be abrasive you don't need to get crazy and do a you know tight tight show clip but I think it's important to do kind of a, a pretty medium level clip so that the fur can actually dry out during the day and you don't get that sort of thick, wet, macerated fur on there. I think that can be very helpful too. Yes. Unfortunately, with topicals being put on limbs, often we see the issue where it gets put on, put on, put on. Mm -hmm. Before you know it, you've got this big coagulated crust of medication. <laughs> yes. And everything's having a party underneath it yes so that's great advice i think is to keep that hair short mm -hmm. and so that would really sort of stop that happening and wipe off what you put on yeah you know you make you bring up a great point that you can cake things on layer after layer well if i'm putting a fresh layer of antibiotic cream on there but i'm putting it over top of six layers of old antibiotic cream it's really not doing much so i think it is important to have a nice cleaning schedule with them that you get some of the old medications off if they're still there now if you want to hose the legs for example I like that. But a big thing is dry them afterwards, mm -hmm. especially if you're somebody that likes to do a lot of routine whole body bathing. I talk to people a lot about this because anytime you bathe a horse, you know, we sweat scraper the whole body off. But what part can you not effectively sweat scraper? The distal limbs. It's really hard, I think, to do that just because of how they how they are. Mm -hmm. And then where's gravity going to take all the water that you left on the body down to the distal limb? So bathing is great, but I see a lot of scratches in horses that are bathed routinely. And I think part of that can be that we may dry their legs off right at the time of 
bathing, but then go check on him 20 minutes later and you'd be surprised how much water and moisture has made its way onto that horse's leg just from gravity taking it from the body down. So pay close attention to keeping those legs dry, not just at bath time, but shortly after bath time as well and seeing kind of how much uh, gravity has, has made your life difficult. Yeah. You know, that's actually sage advice because you're exactly right. The top of the horse is dry yeah. and the legs are still wet. Always. <laughs> so let's uh, talk about medications now. Um, yeah. You mentioned antibacterial, you mentioned anti-inflammatories, corticosteroids. Um, walk us through your approach to the use of those medications. Yeah, I, well, I've got a number on the next couple of slides. I've got a number of couple of things to talk about. Right before we get there, I want to also say a mantra again that I say, which is don't scratch scratches. Nothing hurts my soul more than when I see a cute little girl in pigtails with her pony with scratches and she's got her metal curry comb and her bucket of water and she's ready to go get all the scabs off. You can absolutely introduce deeper bacteria and cause more irritation by going to town on these crusts. Gentle removal of crusts like with just your hands or a soft brush, I'm fine with that. But if you're going in there and going cuckoo and scraping and scrubbing, you're probably doing too much. And I've been to a lot of barns where the next day I'll go out and I'll look and those horses that were just scrubbed well they're kind of puffy and stocked up the next day and i'm like ah, i think we did that to the horse right. so another mantra before you put your treatments on is don't scratch scratches so keep calm and don't scratch on <laughs> um, <laughs> so, i'll buy the t-shirt <laughs> oh yeah I'm, I'll, I'm, the merch is coming merch is coming so as far as topicals go uh, first thing i do want to talk about shampoos people love shampoos and medicated shampoos are great but for the reasons we just talked about they have some difficulties so a they can keep the leg too wet and that's sometimes what i don't like about them the other thing is for a medicated shampoo to hold on i don't want to restart for a medicated shampoo to be effective, it technically needs to sit on the skin for 10 minutes. So I encourage every one of my clients, every time I lecture to clients, I always set a timer for 10 minutes and say, okay, we'll, we'll get back when it's time to rinse your horse's shampoo. And then we come back, you know, 10 minutes later and everybody's like, oh, I never do that. There's no way. And I agree. I, you know, it's 10 minutes for me to wash my dog too. I never leave it on for 10 minutes because I'm too lazy. So medicated shampoos are cool when they work well, but I think they're difficult to do well. So I often don't reach for medicated shampoos. I'm much more of a user of lotions, potions, ointments, sprays, things of that nature. Um, one of my most favorite treatments uh, is what I fondly refer to as LSD, but it's not the trippy drug, it's lime sulfur dip. Mm -hmm. And it smells horrible, as you might imagine, like rotten eggs, but anything that smells that bad has got to work, right? That's always, <laughs> that's always the way I think about it. And uh, I love this product because it works super well. And the reasons it works well are that it treats bacteria, it treats fungus like ringworm, it also helps um, with anti-itch, it helps with some of those scabs that are there, it treats ectoparasites. So, you know, when we talked about the fact that there's a ton of different causes for scratches, this product hits a lot of those boxes, which is what I like about it. The other thing I like about it is it doesn't keep the leg wet. You know, you spray it on or you sponge it on and it dries, it's like a dip, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, and therefore it doesn't keep the limb wet. So I really really like that about it. It's not caking things on. You just spray a thin layer. Now, the biggest things, if you're going to lose, use lime sulfur, it, critical to dilute it because I love my horse clients, but a lot of them think if a little is good, a lot is better. Do not put lime sulfur on full strength. You'll get a chemical burn. So it's very important that people dilute this. And uh, I usually, like I said, spray it or sponge it on. Now, I wouldn't do it on a white pony immediately before, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to get in the hunt ring the next day because it will turn your pony yellow. Um, you might want to wear gloves in case you have a sense sensitivity, but this is a product I have people use all the time because you can buy it over the counter. Uh, you can get it at, you know, Tractor Supply, Agway, other stores like that. So I like it a lot. Mm. There are some other things that I think can be very helpful, and those are the ointments and creams that are out there. My biggest thing is if it's something super oozy, I don't put an ointment on it. If the leg really wants to ooze, I don't like to put a heavy, thick ointment on it because that can actually trap the bacteria and trap the goo in there. So um, then I go for more cream type of things. So there's a lot of excellent creams out there. Um, silver sulfadiazine is mm -hmm. one I've used fairly regularly. Um, there's all sorts of home concoctions that veterinarians make that may have something like desitin in it. And I think there's a lot of good products so I can't tell you hey there's one product that works every time I think there are a lot of good products and you know chat with your family veterinarian about what success they have and I'm sure they've got something on the docket that they like there's a newer product out there called Xeracel that I've been using a fair bit for distal limb dermatitis it seems to work really well so I like the um, creams the ointments I do like for certain cases but again just be careful if things are really oozy 
And then there's all sorts of other treatments, right? There's lots of sprays and lotions and whatnot. Um, just be careful with anything over the counter in the sense that there's a lot of good stuff. But if you feel like you're using it and things are getting worse, stop. I mean, that should be an obvious thing we always think about, but we can create scratches in a horse by putting things on the horse. So if you feel like you're using Mrs. Sally's famous brew that you got and things are getting worse, stop it, you know, clean the horse off, phone a friend, try a different treatment. Um, but there's a lot of stuff I like. On the slide here, one of the products I really like is Vetricin. And Vetricin is a bleach-based product with hypochlorous acid. Again, it's it's just a spray, so it's going to dry really fast. And I know bleach sounds wild, but this product will not bleach your beauty beautiful, you know, stockings or anything like that. Um, and it actually works quite nicely against a lot of bacteria and some mm -hmm. fungi too. So that's a good one. Mm. So another thing uh, to talk about, I think it is where we did kind of bring it up before, is when to call the vet. So know that if you've been putting Mrs. Sally's Famous Brew or, or whatever, if you've been doing something that normally works for you. Let's say you have a chlorhexidine-based shampoo. You normally treat the horse once or twice with that shampoo and it gets better. Great. But if that's not happening this go-round, that's probably the time you should call your vet. And I encourage you not to wait, you know, weeks and months until you do because maybe that horse did need oral antibiotics. Maybe that horse does need steroids. Maybe you've got an ectoparasite like Corey in your draft horse and we need to diagnose and treat that appropriately so if you have a normal routine that works for you wonderful do it i love that but if that routine is not working then i think that's the time to reach out and contact your veterinarian and have them come take a look at your horse yeah that's a good point because most of the time we see these they've been through various cycles of over-the-counter treatments that mm -hmm. you've talked about maybe somebody had some antibacterials lying around and they gave the horse horse comes in and the changes are fairly chronic you have deep crusting scabs you know you may have a little bit of ooze you may have hairless patches the mm -hmm. horse may be itchy and you've got all this secondary damage and so i think that's good advice to have a very short fuse for seeking professional help Absolutely. And there's a lot of cool things your vet can do. So, you know, your vet can do diagnostics of looking for bacteria, skin scrapes to look for ectoparasites, fungal cultures, if we think this is ringworms spread from pony to pony at the show barn sharing the same boots. Um, the bacterial cultures that we talked about earlier, even a biopsy. So there's a lot of really cool things your veterinarian can bring to the table that can help you definitively know what's going on so that you can then choose the most appropriate treatment. And I think it's so important all of veterinary medicine if at first you don't succeed, you miss something. You need to do more diagnostics. Yeah, good advice. Um, length of treatment. Now, that can sort of be a bit of a minefield. You don't want to overtreat, mm -hmm. but you don't want to undertreat. You have to also have a bit of a uh, bit of consideration for not getting anywhere with your course of treatment. How do you work that out in your mind when it's appropriate to treat a long time, short yeah. time? When do I change? How do you approach that, say, for antibacterials? Yeah, I think it, every horse is a little dependent there, and it also depends on how severe things are. So if you have something that's pretty mild, just a little bit of scaling or a little bit of mild scabbing, you should notice <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a significant turnaround. I would say in three to four days, you should be seeing significant progress with the product that you're using. If in seven days things have not budged, absolutely, you're not you're not on the right path. If in three to four days, thing, things don't need to be perfect in three to four days, but they need to be trending in the right direction, they need to be improving. Um, you're not wrong to change protocols even as soon as three or four days, but I usually give it a week to see where we're at. If you're doing two, three weeks before you change, absolutely not. You need to know in seven days whether something's going to work or not. And as far as oral antibiotics go, man, I'll give them one same kind of rule. If I don't see a significant change in seven days, I don't change antibiotics, I culture. Mm -hmm. And that's always my recommendation as a fan of antimicrobial stewardship. I don't want to chuck 17 different systemic antibiotics at a horse. If I'm not seeing a significant difference in seven days, that's usually when I recommend recommend, okay, we either need to just change our topical management and leave orals alone for a minute, or we need to culture and see what's the more appropriate antibiotic for that. But I have the kind of seven day rule mm -hmm. for when things should be improving. I don't need it to be perfect in seven, but significantly improving. And as far as how long to treat, I kind of, I may tend to over treat. You said over, under, I'd rather over than under just about any time. That's the way I, mm -hmm. I endure them all the time. I see patients who get, you know, 90% better and then we stop the treatments and then things blow up. And I think it's the same for scratch. You know, we'll see the horse feel pretty good, but he's got a couple of things left, and then we just stop his treatment. I prefer that we treat anywhere from five to seven days past clinical resolution. So if you feel, and that means, that means normal, that means beautiful leg, not a scratch to be found, not a crust to be found. 
So for example, if you were using lime sulfur, what I usually say is, okay, treat them. And then let's say the leg is perfect and you're happy, do one more treatment. Go mm -hmm. seven days past clinical resolution. That's usually my go-to for that. That's a good rule of thumb. As far as choice of antibacterials go, enrofloxacin mm -hmm. is something that's pretty widely used in the horse. And I think yeah. probably inappropriately in most situations. Yes. I see a lot of skin where this has been used. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you think has some utility? Um, and would it be a first choice in any situation that you're involved in? Enrofloxacin, Batril, the fluoroquinolones, I think just about anybody, small, large, medium animal is going to tell you they should never be a first choice. And never is a big word to say. And I'm not going to speak for acute onset neuro disease in a dog. I don't, I don't talk about brains, but you know, as far as skin is concerned, I do not think that that should be your first choice in skin. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but that's like, you know, bringing out your machine gun for, you know, shooting practice. It's just not necessary. It's too much. So I would usually go for, you know, trusted old SMZs work quite nicely. And that's if you need an oral and a lot of these horses can be managed with topicals is the truth. Mm -hmm. But if you do need a systemic, I think that, you know, potentiated sulfas are usually a really nice go-to. To, but not five days worth. You know, we often again under treat with our antibiotics. If you needed oral antibiotics for that horse's legs, I'm saying you're going to need 14 to maybe 21 days of treatment. So horses are getting five, six, seven days. That's often not enough to get the full effect. And I think that's why we see failure. Not that they're resistant to the sulfas, aka not that we needed to go all the way up to enrofloxacin. I think we just didn't use the sulfas long enough. But then if you use little doses of sulfas for short periods, periods of time multiple times that's a great way to get resistance and I actually just cultured a horse leg the other day that had that kind of pattern of oh he's been on SMZs for seven days seven different times and oh wee is that resistant to lots mm -hmm. of things and now I'm kind of stuck so be careful with the short courses of frequent antibiotics I'd way rather you keep the horse on a longer course until you get past clinical resolution again. You mentioned corticosteroids before, mm -hmm. and that's something that um, a lot of owners especially are a little bit reluctant to use. Mm -hmm. But in so many things that I do, I find them extremely useful. Talk yeah. about corticosteroids for use of skin and horses. Absolutely. I love them. I recognize and respect the risk factor. You know, and if I had a morbidly obese Cushingoid pony, we'd probably have a conversation. But I think, you know, and it's been shown in the literature that the incidence of laminitis is really not as high as a lot of people think. As long as you use appropriate doses for appropriate times and monitor the horse, palpate for, you know, their pulses and their distal limbs, make sure that you're taking them out and they don't have any mild signs of lameness, things like that. When a horse needs a steroid to get the inflammation out of the leg, there's just nothing does it like a steroid. I do use them and I have significant success. And when we talk about photosensitization, vasculitis, not your everyday scratches, but the things that go a step beyond, nothing works as well as a systemic steroid. And you can keep doing antibiotics and creams and topicals. You're never going to get on top of the disease until you actually bite the bullet and go for the steroids. And I would argue you should always try to use them sooner rather than later, because if you wait a year and a half, now I have to use a huge dose of steroids to get that horse back under control. And now there is a higher risk. So I would rather see people use steroids a little earlier in the disease processes so that we could use less of it. Um, and I think that'd be more effective for a lot of these horses. There's also topical steroids and I use topical steroids fairly regularly in these limbs. There's some nice sprays. You can get some creams from places like CVS. And if you're really afraid of the systemics uh, or you can even use systemics and topicals, that can be very helpful in a lot of these horses. But when you need them, you need them in derm. And, and I don't think that we should fear steroids. I don't. You have a diverse caseload and you mm -hmm. work on other species besides yeah. horses. Anything novel in small animals which you found useful to port over to um, uh, lesions and horses? Yeah, so I just started doing something uh, and so far I've been pretty happy with it. It's actually called Fovea and Fovea is a fluorescent light therapy. So it actually uses a photo activated gel and then I have a cool little lamp and I wear orange goggles and I look pretty rad. Um, and you can use that on non-healing wounds and deep pyoderma in small animals and I've had incredible success with that. It's made by Vetikinol. So I've actually just started using it in some uh, horse lesions that I've had. And so far, I'm actually pretty happy with what's going on with that. So as far as some of these deep resistant uh, distal limb issues, I'd love to start using more of the fovea. I think that'd be pretty cool. That's a good review of corticosteroids. Are there any other novel anti-inflammatories currently on the market which have a place in horses? Yeah, so there's one called Apoquel, which is Oclacidinib, um, and that's a pretty cool thing that we I use literally daily. It is the it is the number one prescribed drug to dogs in America, period. 
that tells you anything Um, because drug dog allergies are my bread and butter as you might imagine Um, and actually it's one that has been shown to be pretty safe in horses and the downside is it's expensive you have to use a lot of it Um, but it is kind of what I call immunomodulation light so I think that it's nice for some of these inflammatory and allergic conditions in horses and I've absolutely seen a decent amount of crossover um, with uh, success in horses in Apoquel so something to think about there. Yeah, absolutely. We're always looking for different ways to uh, to treat the horses. Hives is a major problem, mm. and that may flow a little bit from what we just talked about. Absolutely. So speaking of Apoquel, right, Apoquel is one of the drugs that we use to treat hives and horses. And I love hives. I think they're the coolest things. Uh, horses make the most beautiful hives in the world. They always get me very excited. So I got a picture up there to show you some beauties. You may hear us refer to them as urticaria. What a fun word, but that just means hives, right? So remember that these are raised soft swellings. They can be round or flat top, donut shaped. They can do all sorts of cool things. They can look really weird. So if you go out and you're like, whoa, my horse's skin is looking funky, my guess is it probably is a hive that's causing it. So an important thing to note is if it really is a hive, because horses get lots of bumps for lots of reasons. And many times it is a hive, but it can also be something a little bit more serious than that. So uh, if it is a hive, it needs to go away in 24 to 48 hours. And oftentimes people will come back and look at their horse 24, 48, 48 hours later and say, oh, but there's still bumps. So they're still here. But the truth is it's probably a new bump because oftentimes when they have a lot of hives, they're you know getting rid of the old ones and replacing them with new ones. So what I have people do is I have people actually circle a bump Mm -hmm. and I have them circle that directly with like a magic marker or something like that and then go out 24 hours later and see if that particular bump has gone away. Now, there could be new bumps. I I don't care if there's new ones, but if that one has gone away in the 24, 48 hours, yes, you confirm that you have hives. If you feel like the bumps are not changing, you circle a couple of them and they are staying the same and it's always the same bumps that are there, well, then you could have staphylococcal folliculitis, erythema multiformia, drug reaction, all sorts of other things. So it's important for you to know that it definitively is a hive and circling them can be really helpful. Yeah, that's actually really good advice to do that circling because Mm -hmm. exactly that the horse has hived. He's been here for three or four days and it's important whether they're the same ones. And that's Mm -hmm. something that nobody can tell us unless they do the sort of thing that you've just sort of talked about. So what's going to cause these hives? Like you think about like um, an allergic reaction or Mm -hmm. maybe bitten by a fly or what's driving these hives? Absolutely. I have another fun mantra here because I love mantras. And the big thing, you, the big three you want to think about with causing hives are food, bug, drug. So the number one thing that I see causing hives in horses, and we'll go back to that, is food. Um, And we'll talk about that again in a second. But I always think about what changes in the diet. The second thing are bugs. Bugs absolutely can cause hives in horses. And the third thing is a potential drug reaction. A fourth that I have on there that's a little lower but true is also allergies. So I always do my due diligence with a hivey horse to rule out food bug drug. And then I'm left with an allergic horse. And that's why that horse is getting the hives. So briefly, if you do see a horse that has hives on it, you know, if they're little and they're transient, they're coming and they're going and they're not bothering the horse, you don't need to call your vet out on a Saturday night. It's not necessarily time and money well spent. But the times you do need to call your vet are if the hives are progressing to severe swelling, particularly if you're noticing that in the facial area, um, because those can get to difficulty breathing. So call your vet if they're progressive, the swelling is getting there in the face. Um, Another thing to call is if you're like, you know, my horse has had these hives, they're not bothering him horribly, but man, they just won't go away. They're here, they're gone, they're here, they're gone. That's another good time to get your vet involved. And then if your horse had hives, that now you notice it was kind of oozy and sticky and now your horse has some crusts on it hives can actually ooze serum and predispose a horse to getting secondary staph infections so people will say well his hives won't go away Mm -hmm. but it's actually that his hives went away but now staph the bacterial infection is there so that's another time that you might want to call your veterinarian So the biggest thing with hives, that food bug drug mantra, is you want to find and eliminate the underlying cause. And there are things I think about. So food, for example. Hay is probably the number one thing that I see causing hives in horses. So I always ask the clients, is this a new batch of hay? Is this a new bale of hay? Is this a new vendor? Uh, Did you get it from a different section of the barn? And many times the answer to that is yes. And that's in any species. Uh, In cows in particular, I see that all the time. If that's the case, go back to the old hay and you probably have saw that problem. Now, what was it in the hay that triggered the hives? We may know, we may never know. You know, it could be that they picked up a certain plant in the field, something like that. With food, I'm also thinking about supplements. 
I know horse owners love to give supplements, everybody favorite things. And man, do I see supplement reactions with some regularity. I've seen legitimate supplement um, allergies in horses. So I try to strip it down to bare bones, man. If you don't need that vitamin E and selenium for a couple of days, take it away and see if that horse continues to have the recurrent hives when you remove, always go for what you last introduced. You know, if you just started a new joint supplement, remove the joint supplement and see if that makes a difference. So that's a big one. I've also seen um, grains. A new grain batch can be something that can cause hives in horses. Maybe you started a new particular type of grain, or if you've been getting it from the same company, you got a new shipment of grain. I've seen that cause hives. Um, turnout, shampoo, tack. Think about all the new variables that are introduced into that horse's life and, and remove what you can. You really become kind of a expert uh, Sherlock Holmes when horses are hivey, and you, re- and you need to be. You need to sit down, create a little diary. I love a hive diary. It's one of my favorite things. Um, but create a little diary. I gave him this. I used this spray. I used a new saddle pad that I just washed in this fancy smelly detergent. Um, horses can have hives triggered by any number of things. So I think thorough history taking and having a hive diary can be really helpful. Oftentimes, if you can identify the cause, get rid of it and you're fine. And I love those cases. Now, if you go through everything uh, and you can't identify the cause and this horse has severe hives, we often move into treating those hives. And I think that a lot of times they do need it. And histamines in horses are a Band-Aid treatment that can work in some horses, but often don't work in a lot of them. But I throw them out there as an option. Zyrtec is one I use a fair bit in horses. Try his granules, um, hydroxazine. There's a couple antihistamines that seem to work pretty well. Reach out to your family vet, you know, if you'd like to pursue some antihistamines. Remember, though, that if you're actively showing that horse, a lot of times antihistamines are not sanctioned for show. So be careful with that. Uh, Again, we talk about steroids are another great way to treat hives. And if you have a horse that has severe hives, absolutely call your family vet out and don't fear the steroid. They can be hugely helpful in breaking that hive cycle. And there are also medications that can help with some of these horses like nutraceutical supplements that are high in omega-3-6s. Platinum performance makes a skin and allergy supplement, for example. And all of that is helpful if you've got this chronic hive horse that you can't identify the source. But This is where I really think that, you know, veterinarians and especially dermatologists can come in and help you because if you can't find the source and we think that we're dealing with an allergic horse and man, horse allergies, they love to make hives. It's one of their favorite things to do. Um, I love to do intradermal skin testing for these guys. And what we do is we essentially try to recreate the hives by clipping a patch on the neck, and then we inject into the skin different allergens. And I'm literally injecting the allergens so that I can say, is this horse sensitive or not? And if the horse makes a big hive where I inject the allergen, boom, he's sensitive to that particular thing. So things I commonly see with horses, uh, ragweed, all sorts of hays and grasses. I've had some horses that, man, they're allergic to every grass. How fun is that? Um, but the reason we test these horses, it's great to test and know what they're allergic to, but the real reason I test them is actually to create immunotherapy. So testing for avoidance, people love to say, oh, let me test my horse so that I can avoid the things he's allergic to. Well, I always tell people, if you know how to avoid ragweed, you don't tell anybody else. You tell me and we're going to be rich together mm-hmm. because there is no way. You know, just like how do you avoid Kentucky blue? bluegrass you can't is the moral of that story we can't keep our horses in bubbles it just doesn't work unfortunately same with dogs and cats and humans but immunotherapy which is where we create a specific allergy injection or allergy vaccine for that horse with the goal to desensitize them or kind of calm their immune system back down they are my most favorite species to do immunotherapy in. they respond beautifully i have probably an 80 to 90 percent success rate with my hy horses on immunotherapy it's all natural drug-free, exceedingly safe. So it's something that I recommend for these chronic hive horses because I have a great, um, great index of success with them. Yes, it was always something that I was a little bit skeptical of how can this work. Mm -hmm. But I must admit that there's been a few cases that were intractable bar for desensitization. Mm -hmm. And then they got to come off all the other drugs. That's the best part. And the horse um, became a joy to the owner instead of a source of extreme stress. Yes. And you're not dealing with steroids or antihistamines or that cycle of always hives. He doesn't, he does, he doesn't. And also, if you want to show that horse, perfectly legal to show on immunotherapy. There's no restrictions for that. So I also love for most of my horses, I can have them on their immunotherapy shot usually once every two weeks. I can tinker with that, though. That's the other beautiful thing. If you have a horse that needs it a smaller volume a couple times a week, I can 
can do that. If you have a horse that gets it once a month, wonderful. I can also um, stretch the injections out in the winter time often if the horse doesn't have any winter allergies. Mm -hmm. And then I can increase the frequency in the summer. So we can tinker with this and I've really had great success. Again, my favorite species to do intradermal skin testing and immunotherapy on is horses. Um, and I've even seen it help some horses that have uh, heaves or mm -hmm. equine asthma. Um, not every horse, you know, but I certainly do that test fairly routinely for that as well. So this is a great way to get your family friendly dermatologist involved because most general practitioners don't do intradermal skin testing. It's very expensive to have all the allergens and it's also an art form reading the test. You have to know what you're doing and be trained in it. But I think this is something that um, I love doing and I love offering to clients. Yeah, it absolutely. Um, plus one, what everything you just said with that is that it's added so much to the patients I deal with and have been predominantly the heavy horses because mm -hmm. you can't eliminate yeah. the environment you can't stop them breathing mm -hmm. and you can't take the things away that they're breathing in and so where this has been really useful getting a board a certified dermatologist involved was to tr help treat the lungs of the horse which seems like a weird thing but the lungs are like the skin like the mm -hmm. gut they're surfaces that contact the outside and responds to the allergens that are in there and it it really made the difference in so many cases to have that intradermal allergen testing done it allowed us to find out what the problem was, what we could manage, mm -hmm. and give that horse a chance to live a much more drug-free life than we ever could have. Yes, and you're getting at it from the root of the problem. Yep. You're rewiring the immune system from the root as opposed to Band-Aid treatments. And to me, it's always better to get to the source and try to you know change things where you can at the source as opposed to just yep. you know down the river doing the Band-Aid treatments. Yep, I'm yeah. a believer. Great. So any... Um, any pearls of wisdom uh, for uh, people that are struggling with the skin of their horse? Yeah, so first of all, get your veterinarian involved. I think that's really important because we we have a lot to offer you. We've got diagnostics we can do. Um, and then once you get your veterinarian involved, get your veterinary dermatologist involved. You know, they can contact me and talk about things. Um, there's a lot we can do for these horses. And I think getting early referral, but also early vet care can be very helpful. You know, if you've tried something again for that seven days and it's not doing it, it's time to seek help elsewhere. Yeah, we absolutely have, um, all of us here have appreciated your input on our cases that we've got you to consult on and you've made us look a whole lot better than we would have by ourselves. I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> so that was stall side for this week. I was talking to Dr. Julia Miller, board certified equine dermatologist. See you next time. <laughs>